as I said, today I'm going to talk about Nime and Python. And that's why the name of my presentation is going to be Trip to Nime Python World. And I assure you that this trip will be amazing for me and for you as well. Now, going ahead, first I'd like to introduce myself. So I'm Hantesh Patatko. I work as a data scientist here at Nime. Uh, you can also call me Monty. That's my nickname. And if you have any questions regarding Nime, Python, or in general about Nime, just write to me at this email ID. Talking about the agenda for today's presentation, uh, first I'm going to talk about low-code approach, then where do you use low-code approaches and how do you build low-code solutions. So for today we're going to take a simple use case, simple and relatable use case, and build a low-code solution using Nime and Python for this particular use case. After that, we are going to discuss about the bundled environment and then the Conda environment propagation. At this point of time, these words might seem like uh, unfamiliar or alien words to you. But by the end of my presentation, you will be well familiar with the bundled environment and also Conda pro environment propagation. So to start with, uh, in every organization or a group of users, you'd always see that there are some users who are part of the yellow bubble here and which is basically no code users. That means users who do not prefer coding and they prefer visual uh, coding, programming, or I would say building workflows to perform the tasks. On the other hand, there are users who fall inside the red circle or bubble, which is pure coding. That means they prefer using coding languages like Python or Java or many different languages to perform their day-to-day -day tasks. But also at the intersection of these two, we have some users called as low-code users and they prefer combination of both of these approaches to do their day-to-day -day tasks. And why did why they prefer this is because, you know, using this low-code approaches, they can build complex solutions by using simple drag and drop, drag and drop interface. Even at Nine, we provide you several nodes where you can just write your uh, Python scripts, execute them, and build these low-code solutions. So in further slides, I'm going to talk about how do you build a low-code solution. I just wanted to provide you an intuition on what a low-code approach is. But typically, where can we use this low-code approaches? Now, imagine a situation that in an organization, there are three teams, the Python team, the marketing team, and the finance team. As the Python team is well equipped with Python, they use Python in everyday uh, life for doing the tasks. Uh, marketing and finance are not well versed with coding, so they use the no-code tool 9 for their tasks. Now, if uh, there is a new package in Python that uh, is useful for the finance team, they cannot use it because of their lack of knowledge regarding coding or Python as such. But now, uh, using the low-code solutions, the Python team can build low-code workflows or components that have Python scripts inside them and give these solutions to the finance team. And how this helps is that now the finance team is not dependent upon Python team to run all their uh, work or, you know, use these new packages. The finance team can just execute all of these workflows and get the solution from these Python packages. So in a nutshell, the finance team is able to use the Python packages even without coding or knowing nine or a single line of code. They are able to use the Python packages using the low-code solutions. And that is what motivates us to build low-code solutions so that it could be shared and used by many no-code and low-code users. Now, uh, for today's use case, uh, I'm going to consider a very, hypo first of all, it's a hypothetical use case. Uh, because there are many different uh, complex things that could be done, but I'm going with a simple and a relatable situation, which is that uh, we have a pizza company in San Francisco, and that is responsible for, you know, uh, delivering pizzas across San Francisco. But for that, they have the delivery agents. Uh, now, a typical delivery agent could start from a location and then use different routes to reach the destination and they could go on delivering pizzas along the route. Now the pizza company here wants to find out the total trip distance. That means in the case that I'm showing you right now, we want to find out the total distance traveled by this particular delivery agent along the blue route that we see on the map. Now to, first of all to compute this, let's look at the data. 
what it looks like and what are the different uh, features available to us. First of all, there are two tables. The first table is the trip details. That means it talks about the delivery agent and his or her trip information. As in the trip started from Golden Gate Park, the start, and then it, it ended at Rincon Park by taking all the different drop locations in between. Now the second table is the location table where we have all the different locations in San Francisco and the locations longitude and latitude information. Now as a data scientist, when I look at these two tables, I can clearly see that if I join the data on the trip and the locations column, I would be able to acquire the trip coordinates. Now in this case, uh, the trip coordinates would be like providing the GPS locations for Golden Gate Park and then the route chosen by the delivery agent till the Rincon Park. Now, when I did a little bit of research on how to calculate the distance between two points given the GPS coordinates, it appeared to me that Haver sign formula is used by all the standard applications or APIs to calculate this distance. Now, how this Haversen formula was invented, discovered, or, you know, a geometric definition, I'm not going into those details because that's already available and it's used pretty much everywhere. For now, if I want to implement this using Python, uh, I did some research and I found out that there is this Python package called as scikit-learn, which is, I would say, a pretty famous package because it is used for many different uh, machine learning tasks as well. But it also provides you the Haver sign distance here. If you see this Haver sign distance. So uh, what I see from here is that if I write a simple function which takes in the coordinate initial and the end coordinate and then use the Haver sign distance function from uh, the scikit-learn matrix, I could compute the distance traveled by each delivery agent. As in using this uh, geo distance function that I wrote here, I can see that I was able to calculate the distance traveled by the delivery agent. On the on the light on the right hand side, if you see there's a new column added, which is the trip distance column, which provides the distance in kilometers and it's a cumulative column. That means initially the distance is zero. Once the delivery agent goes to Fulton playground from Golden Gate Park, it's 0 0.93 kilometers and it keeps on adding after that. So at the end, when the delivery agent completes uh, his or her uh, drop location or the trip, Rincon Park, the total distance traveled is 15.93 kilometers. Now, the same thing, if I were to do it using a low-code approach, that means a combination of pure uh, code and also workflows. So as you can see here, in we, are built, we have built a workflow here. In the first part, that is the orange annotations, you can see we are reading the data and then we are joining it as we have seen it in the initial uh, in the initial slides that we were joining it on the map and on the location and the trip column. Once the data is ready, we are computing the distance traveled using the Python code that we have. Uh, the Python code that I just showed you in the previous slides, it's available here and I'm inserting this Python code into this node which is called as the Python script labs node and thereon I can see that the distance is computed. Now the advantages here is that it's easy to easy to maintain and debug as in if tomorrow the uh, data source changes there's a new uh, data coming up I can directly insert and read the data into the orange annotations so it's easy for me to understand and also to debug and maintain this workflow and secondly easy to explain right now if I were to write a Python code to show join and all, it would be a little bit chaotic in my opinion. But using this workflow, it's easy to show because the data is flowing from left to right. And I can show you that I read the data, then I join it, and then, and then I compute the distances. And at last, easy to edit and make changes. So if tomorrow I'm not in office and I want to share this workflow with my colleague Paolo here, I can just share this workflow and then I can explain, him, explain it to him in a couple of minutes. So I think that's why I would say it's easy to interpret, explain to others, and also Polo can make changes on its own because it's pretty easy to see what's happening here. Now, as you clearly see that now we have discussed this workflow, but the question here is what is the Python script labs node? And that's why I'm going to talk about the Python script labs node, which came out recently. Uh, this node is currently part of the NIME extension, that is NIME Python integration labs. Uh, this particular Python script labs node provides you uh, an improved performance over the non-labs node that we had initially. 
Now this supports conversion. That means now you can read your data as a pandas data frame and also as a PyRS table based on the application that you want to perform using Panda, using Python. And if you have sufficiently large data sets, you can also handle them efficiently because now this particular node also supports batch executions. That means you can read data in batches, perform some executions and again store the data elsewhere and it won't put a lot of pressure on the RAM of your system. If you want to read more about the Python script labs node, then we have this blog post linked here, which is lightning fast data transfer between NIME and Python using this integration, using the Python labs. You can read more about it here. At this point of time, I like to switch uh, to NIME Analytics platform and show you the how this Python script lab nodes uh, looks like and how to get it to your NIME Analytics platform. So in here, I have the NIME uh, Analytics platform with me. Uh, to get the Python script labs node, as I said, we should have the Python integration labs and that's why I go to file and I go to install nine extensions. In here, uh, I write Python labs. Just a minute, let me write Python labs. As you see, it takes a couple of minutes to see that the second thing over here is nine Python integration labs. I can select it, keep on pressing next, next, and then this extension will be installed to my nine Linux platform but I already have it in my system, so I'm not going to again download it or install it. Uh, but now what this does is that if I write Python here, Python script labs, as you see, um, as the Python labs extension, I have installed the Python labs extension to my system, which is why now the Python script labs node is available in the node repository and I can drag it to my Nymalix platform. Now moving on to the solution that I showed you, that means the low code solution about the distance calculation. This was the exact workflow that I talked about in the slides. That is in the first part, we read the data, we join it. And if you want to look at the data, I can show you. Uh, this is the same data, right? The Golden Gate Park, then the, and we entered the Rincon Park and then trip look, uh, the trip coordinates basically. Now, if you, if I, if I open the Python script labs node, I hope you guys are aware that the UI of this, uh, the panel or the UI of this Python script labs node is exactly similar to what we have for the Python script node. Uh, that means the input variables, the columns of the table, uh, the input table here, then the flow variables, and then we write the script or the Python code in here. And then here we can see output variables and then the console. Now, I, I showed you that I had written a geodistance function initially and I had copied the function into, uh, I, I copied the function and inserted it, inserted it here. And after a little bit of coding and adding the output port, as you see that I have written it as nine dot, I mean, KNI dot output table is equal to the uh, function output that I got from geodistance. If I execute this Python script lab node, it will take a moment and it would be able to show me the exactly 15.931 that is the total distance traveled which the python code was able to provide so basically what i did was i just copied the python code that i already had i pasted it inside the python script labs node and i was able to get the same answer that python was able to provide me but now a thing surprises me here is that i do not have python installed on my system i just use the python script labs node I inserted the code that I already had for Haver sign distance and I was able to get the exact output that I was able to get in Python. So it surprises me that how is this possible that Nine analytics platform is able to execute a Python code even when there is no Python on my system. So now to know why, why it was able to do it, I like to go back to the presentation because the answer lies in here. I'll have to switch this view, okay. And now the answer is basically bundled environment. That means uh, when I install the Python Labs extension to my system, it comes with an inbuilt Python environment. And this inbuilt Python environment is, is called as the bundled environment. Now, 
this bundle environment consists of a selection of Python packages which helps you to get started. So in a nutshell, if you just install this extension, you could directly start coding Python inside this Python script node even without even bothering about the Python in your system or Anaconda, Miniconda, different kinds of Python installations. That's how simple it is. And at last, if you look at uh, these uh, libraries or these packages, Python packages, these are the Python packages that will help you to get started. The beautiful soup can help you for, uh, you know, web scrapping. If you want to do machine learning, then you have scikit-learn, pandas, numpy. Then if you want to do some stats, you have stats model, scipy. And for visualization as well, you have seedborn. Many uh, packages that are popular and helpful for you to get started are available in the bundled environment. If you want to know more about bundled environment, then you can go to this documentation link that I have provided, which tells you in detail about, about how to use it, which I already showed it to you. Now, uh, talking about the next part, which is if you want to use a package that is not in the bundled environment, then how should you approach this? For example, uh, now imagine that we are doing the same activity that is calculating the distance but now we are made aware of this new package called as GeoPy which is an actual package in Python and now it is used widely for you know calculating the distances accurately I mean initially we had the Haversign formula but now with this package it was this is able to calculate distances accurately and also it provides us the distance in kilometers and miles that means different measurement different different measuring units if you want to read about this GeoPy package, then you know you can go to the documentation of GeoPy, uh, which is available on this link. And now, if you look at the bundled environment packages that I showed, and you can check in these boxes that there is Geo, there is no GeoPy. That means GeoPy is not included in the bundled environment, which is why I would like to uh, you know showcase how do you use packages that are not in the bundled environment and how do you build the solutions for that step one in first step uh, I'm assuming that now you have the Python labs extension which I showed you in the demo that it, you have installed it secondly in this situation you would require anaconda or miniconda installed on your system now once you have these two prerequisites you have to go to your nine platform from in there to preferences in preferences when you go to Python labs now is the time that you switch to conda environment from bundled because the bundled environment do not have the GeoPy package that's why we go to conda environment in here we say that we uh, want a new environment because for every new project it's the best practice to create a new environment now once this new environment is created I would name it as py3 I mean nine geo distance because I'm basically doing just geo distance calculation here upon cl clicking the create new environment button here the new environment will be created which will have all the packages that are required for the nine and Python integration upon this uh, I have to go to anaconda prompt activate this environment that we just created and install the GeoPy package that we need this is step two in the third step we use the same workflow but inside the python script labs node now we remove the geo distance function that we were using that had the psych scikit learn have assigned distance um, you know all the initial part that we had now we remove it because we decided to use the geopy distance which is this command here that from geopy package we are using the distance and that is why at last if you see that now the distance is calculated using the new package the geopy package and we have the distance in kilometer as well as miles this step three now step four is critical because this is how uh, your workflow uh, I mean this is this is critical and I'll explain you why first of all you need to add the conda environment propagation node here which you can see uh, in the green annotation that apart from the Python script labs node you have a new node here which is the conda environment propagation now what conda environment propagation node does is that uh, it will ship the environment that we just created which is the geo distance environment we just created now this environment will be shipped from your system along with this workflow and now if I uh, ship this workflow to my colleagues uh, you know system so at his system 
this node will make sure that a new environment called as GeoDistance, which I named it here, will be created and that will have the GeoBy package. I mean, the in a nutshell, this node ships the environment with the node uh, so that when, wherever it is executed, uh, that system will have this environment and there would be no messages saying that this environment, uh, this package not found because we are shipping the environment itself with the workflow. And that's why how do we configure it? So first of all, uh, once I double click on the Conda environment propagation, I can look at this configuration window and you see that I'm choosing the environment that I need here. That is the py 39 GeoDistance. Then I'm selecting the packages that I want to be shipped with this environment. Or simply I could just click on this option which is include only explicitly installed packages. That means packages that I installed extra and at last I will name the output variable. Now as you see the flow variable coming out of this node, the red color flow variable. So I'm going to name it as py 39 geodistance. That means now this variable consists of all the information about the environment that I created. Next. Uh, I just click on the Python script labs node and if I go to the executable selection tab then I select the red variable name. The red variable which we created right now is py 39 geodistance which tells the Python script node to use this environment every time it is executed. Right? So this makes our problem statement simpler and easier now. Whenever you don't have a package into the bundled environment you create a new environment, you install, I mean, you know, pip install or conda install that package to your system, then you connect conda environment propagation node and now your workflow is ready to be shipped. Now you can ship this workflow to Nime server, to Nime hub or to any of your colleagues and they can execute this workflow without errors because the environment itself is shipped. To provide you a demo on this, I would go to Nime Analytics platform and if you look at this workflow, uh, now you see it's not bundled so we have an extra node here that is the conda environment propagation just to show you uh, the configuration dialog uh, okay it opened uh, it will take a couple of minutes to load because it's showing you all the packages that are available in this particular environment and at last you can see that I have named the output variable name as py39 geodistance and then if you see here, there would be a blue tick on the GeoPy package because it is being shipped. <clears throat> so that's how you build a low-code solution if the package is not in the bundle environment. But here at Nine, we you know we also consider it a best practice to build re reliable and reusable solutions that uh, can be shared on Nine Hub, which we also know which we also know as the nine components. So to build a nine component here, we select this particular nodes and I can just say create component. And now I can name this component as geo distance. Uh, sorry for the spelling mistakes. And now we are using GeoPy, so I would like to say that using GeoPy. Now if I just press OK. It will take a couple of seconds or minutes, I would say, to make these four nodes into a component which could be shared on NimeHub and which could be used by anyone to compute the, compute the geo distances. Now in here it's taking a couple of minutes, but uh, which is why I already created a component and placed it on NimeHub so that it's easy for anyone to use it. If we now look at the next use case, now here I have exactly the same structure, but here I have data for a different agent. That means an agent who started from San Francisco Zoo to Fallen Ridge Park. Now if I want to calculate the distance here, as I said, uh, I already have the component on NimeHub. I could just go to NimeHub and this is the geo distance uh, component that I had created and shared. I can directly drag this and place it here. Now I have to connect this to GeoPy component. It will take one minute and load all the data. I, I had also added some of the configuration dialogs in here so that the user can select which are which columns. The trip point column is this latitude and the longitude column I can select from here. Press OK. And now if I execute it, so now this 
particular component is able to calculate the distance traveled by another agent. I mean, we are just changing the input information here, but you see the component is calculating the distance using the GeoPy package. So that's how you build uh, components that are reliable and reusable. And now your component can be used by anyone to calculate the distance. As in, in this particular case, this particular agent completed 7.6 kilometers or 4.7 miles. And all of this comes from the Python package that is inside and executed using the Conda propagation node. Now, going to the next part, uh, I mean, we, I already talked about Python scripted components and showed you a demo about it. <clears throat> Further, I like to talk about developing nodes using pure code, which uh, is a feature that came out with 9.4.6. Uh, as you see, till now, we have talked about no code. We talked about low code. That means the solutions that we just built. But what about pure code? Uh, that means what about users who are accustomed with writing Python, uh, using Python every day? How can they uh, how can they develop nodes that that can be used by other users? As in this case, if you see with 4.6, we uh, have made it a feature where you can code the entire nine node into Python. As in this script, as in you can see the black screen, we are writing the geo distance function entirely, and that gets converted into a nine node to provide you a, uh, a demo on this i can show you that this is a github repository by me and paulo so it consists of all the codes that all the python code that we wrote for this particular node uh, my extension.py if you see in here uh, we have the Python code which computes the distance from the longitude and latitude information and at last it provides us a table uh, on table on how much the distance was. Now uh, you can also write you know Python code and convert that into a nine node for that uh, we have written a blog post recently which will help you to uh, follow the process but once I had written this node if I go to my node repository and if I write geo distance your distance you can see this is the node that i and paulo uh, we created uh, i mean we wrote entire script in python and then the node is available here because in nine we did not have a particular node to calculate the distance between two locations given the gps coordinates now this acts like a pure nine node because if you double click you'd be able to see that we can add configuration here you can, we can this is like a dialogue where you can choose which column does what and after providing the inputs at these two locations you can compute the distances uh, for here as you see the same information we provided and in geo distances we are able to say that we want a distance in kilometers then the location column latitude and longitude after you know executing it we see that it provides us information from one point to another and also if you look at the view it shows you that the trip started here then you you know went for 0 0.94 kilometers and the trip ended here at Rincon Park and it actually shows you the view on longitude and latitude so how the trip started from and where it ended uh, isn't it amazing that if you have a particular Python package and you want to bring it to nine, then you can make a component out of it or you could directly make a node out of it. And now this node can be shipped to any nine user and they, they don't even have to bother about Python on the system. Uh, Python or Anaconda, they can directly use this node as a native nine node. Now at last, uh, I would like to point you to the resources so that it's easy. Okay, uh, so in here, if you want, uh, you know, if you want to know about the geo distances node that I and Paulo created right now, so we recently released a blog post, four steps. In four steps, it teaches you how to, you know, develop nine nodes using pure Python code. And now the scenario in the beginning, as I showed you, that the Python team could also provide now with pure code nodes, which could directly be used by marketing finance team in, in their nine Linux platform. <laughs> where to find these workflows that i show uh, that i pro that i used in my demo so they are available on this public space trip to nine python world uh, you can download them and you can execute them next i'm open for q a so if you have any questions i'll close my presentation feel free to ask questions i'm sure that
people were actually in a room, they would all be clapping right now in this uh, uh, majestic conference room we have here. Mm -hmm. So thank you, Monty, for presenting. Uh, I see that people are, are learning how to use their emoji symbols. There is Oli waving there. and uh, mm -hmm. So that's great. So we have a few questions, but to be honest, I took the opportunity to answer some of them, but maybe the audience, mm -hmm. while they, they come up with their question, Hmm. Um, they also want to see what was happening in the chat. So, for example, we have a question from Oli that in the beginning of the presentation was asking, how does the Python script LUTs node uh, with different kind of environments uh, configured on your machine, right? I, I, I think that hmm. towards the, the middle of your presentation, you covered this, but maybe you want to go over this again uh, briefly. Yep, exactly. So if you have an environment configured on your system, uh, you could you could ship it using the Conda propagation node, and then you know anyone who executes your workflow will have the same environment on on their system once they execute this workflow, right? I I, I think that that would uh, be the solution. Also, I, I'm thinking the same. Uh, one point is that Nine will require some extra packages that your on the environment that existing pre-existing before nine doesn't have so you will need to add those and maybe when you when you want this environment to be shipped with a workflow don't include all the packages in there but only the ones that are explicitly installed so that the con environment propagation node for example if the workflow is executed on a windows machine and you created it with a uh, mac like it's it's gonna be work properly but basically yes what monty said right like use the con environment propagation node and you can use any environment you have on your system. Yeah. All right, so I think we have a new question. Mm -hmm. uh, Oli say, says, thanks. Uh, there is someone that was pointing to CICD, mm -hmm. but CICD is actually something that goes beyond Python. It's, uh, it's what the product team is working on, right, Monty, with the new workflow groups it's it's coming out soon we i don't think we can spoil too much can we no i think yeah. <laughs> it's right okay cicd is coming soon uh, uh don't worry um and yeah uh also diazu was asking about uh using visual studio to create those python nodes to have all the pro the proper way to code and so on but maybe take a look at the documentation there to, to have precise information. Yep. All right, so I don't see any more questions. Uh, I think it was a really great presentation. Uh, if you guys want the slides, you need to interact with the object in the top right part of the map. You just go there, press X, and you will download the PDF, all right? And uh, there should be links to download the PDF. All right, so thank you, Monty. Uh, you can now leave the stage. Yep. I guess everyone will be <clears throat> clapping right now. Thank you so much. I get down the stage now. Bye-bye. Yeah, bye. And now it's time for Tata Steel uh, to uh, bring to tell us about their use case with Nime and Python. Establishing a working relationship is the name of the talk. So I would like to welcome Adam and Akash on the stage. And uh, And yeah. Uh, please come on to the stage. I'll, I'll, I'll leave the spotlight for you guys. Hello, everyone. Hi, can you hear us okay? Yes, we can. Yes, we can. Brilliant. Okay, uh, I'll just share my screen now. Um, hi everyone, uh, my name is Adam Bates Gray, um, I'm a, a principal data scientist uh, working at, at Tata Steel. Uh, myself and Akash Roy, who's uh, also on the stage and is uh, a data scientist at Tata Steel as well, we both work for um, the data science and analytics group that we've got in, in R&D in the UK. Um, so hopefully presentation we can give you a little bit of an overview of um, some of the work that we've done, some of the applications we've created that have integrated both Nime and Python, um, and also just how we've um, developed a way of working within the group as well that incorporates uh, incorporates both of those tools as well. Um, so just to give you a quick overview of what we're going to go through, we'll give you a little bit of background on what we do, and we'll talk a little bit about guided analytics, um, 
Akash will then take you through a case study of one of the, the applications that we built. Um, and then a bit of a discussion on, you know, the, the advantages of, of using name and Python or name or Python. Um, and then also the um, some of the considerations we've taken for integrating um, Python into name as well. And then a little bit on some of the future developments we're looking to do and, and some of the improvements that um, we're, we're looking to make as well on, on what we've got already. Um, and then we're happy to take any questions at the end as well. Okay, so as I mentioned, um, we work for, for Tata Steel. Um, so uh, we're a steel manufacturing company and based, um, we've got sites across uh, across the UK really. Um, so we've got uh, our, our primary uh, steel making facility is in South Wales and Port Talbot, but we do have other sites across the UK as well. Um, so I won't go into great detail, but just to give you a bit of an idea of what we do, um, this is a, a kind of simplified version of the steel making process. So you get your raw materials that come in at the start, and they're then converted in a, what's called a blast furnace to, to iron, liquid iron. That iron is then converted into liquid steel across a few processes. The liquid steel is then uh, cast in a continuous casting process into uh, big, big steel slabs, which you can see in the, the top right corner there. Once we've got these solid slabs, and um, then we roll them out so that they're a, a lot thinner and a lot longer, and they can be rolled into into coils. So there's a couple of processes like hot rolling and cold rolling there, and then we have a number of further downstream processes as well, and um, that we we will process the steel in depending on um, what the the use is for it. So for example, if we're um, we might. Uh, coat the steel and zinc for use in, in the automotive industry, or we might apply an organic coating for kind of building systems and, um, and building industry as well, construction industry, and then also other applications such as, as uh, kind of tin plate in the steel for use in um, cans for, for food. Um, uh, and a number of other applications. So you can see um, there's quite a few processes there and, and are, are, we've got quite a diverse range of products. So where do we come in? So us in, in the data science and analytics group, we work across all of the manufacturing processes and kind of helping in a, in a variety of different projects. So typically what we'll do is we'll take data from um, multi, all these um, kind of different manufacturing processes and we've built an infrastructure within NIME um, that automatically pulls all this data together and gets it into our, into our structured data set. Um, I, unfortunately, we don't have much time to, to go into that today, um, but what we really want to cover is, well, once we've got it in that structured data set, what do we want to do with it? So we've got a couple of options, really, that we, we, we kind of consider and are looking to develop as well. Um, the first one being guided analytics, so taking that data and then uh, getting people within the company and kind of taking them through um, some analysis. Um, using various tools and then also we look towards kind of autonomous analytics as well and um, I to kind of uh, and, and kind of automated analytics and um, so where we've got the data coming in constantly and we can um, kind of monitor different parameters what we're typically doing in these projects are kind of looking at maybe root cause analysis of maybe there's a, a, a kind of period of poor production in one of the facilities, or it might be that there's a, a defect comes up for one of our customers. And um, it, it could be a lot of uh, a lot of different things. So um but we we're, we're typically involved in these kind of um analytics projects looking into really kind of problem solving. So I mentioned guided analytics. So what we mean by that is that we create web apps uh, that guide a, a non-expert user through the approach of a data scientist. So that could be like a, an engineer on a plant or people working in marketing or, or all sorts of different um, people with kind of different backgrounds. And what we try and do is with these tools replicate some of the steps that a data scientist might take. And when approaching a new data set or problem. So a, a kind of initial first pass of the data, and um, what would we be looking to do? And can we kind of replicate that? So someone with no data science background can can utilize this and can get the benefit from it without having, say, the, the knowledge and background in data science. And we build these web apps in Nime and, and we deploy through the Nime web portal and um, through the Nime server that we use. Um, and 
within these applications we use a combination of you know general uh, domain name nodes native name nodes and also some integrated uh, python code snippets as well so on the right you can see we've got um a few different applications there so these are our, our five tools that we've deployed so far and um, with a, a various different functions so you've got your data set that comes in we've then got a tool where we, we sample that data set and then you look to do some initial exploration of the data and um, maybe some dimensionality reduction as well, a bit of pre-processing to really refine the data set before finally getting to the, the prediction. So um, building a model and uh, getting a prediction from that, whether that's a, you know, a, a predicted value or whether it's something where, um, you know, we're looking at, at potential parameters that might have an influence on a, on a target variable. And this uh, tool A predict is what we're going to uh, discuss today. Um, it has the, the most amount of Python that we've uh, integrated into it. Um, so Akash is going to uh, take us through um, AA Predict. Cheers, Adam. Uh, hi, everyone. So uh, AA Predict is basically a no-code machine learning tool which we provide to business users uh, within our organization. Basically, we are trying to create what we call a citizen data scientist. It provides a guided analytics to the users uh, uh, which goes through all the domains of a uh, data science life cycle. Uh, it takes care of everything from EDA to uh, feature engineering. It reduces the data set, reduces complexity and intercorrelations to create an appropriate model which can be used in real world in our uh, company. Uh, so as I said, it takes care of various feature engineering techniques as well like downsampling and uh, handling data imbalance explaining each part to the user and assisting them along the journey of model creation and finally deployment, which is again done using a guided uh, analytical uh, tool, which we have again created using Nine. So uh, this is basically the whole workflow of our tool, uh, which was obviously difficult to show in such a small space. So we have indexed it. So there are basically uh, six parts of the workflow. The A part basically sets up the folder where we store the outputs and uh, the model, uh, final model, which is created uh, during the journey of the tool. Uh, the B part basically gives the, an option to the user to either upload a new data set or import a, a final data set from other guided analytics tools, which Adam uh, mentioned to you guys before. Uh, the C part is basically uploading the data and pre-processing, addressing the imbalance, assessing the linearity of the data set. Uh, the D part basically uh, has the Python nodes, uh, which we use to create linear or non-linear models, depending on the choice made by the user. Uh, after that, uh, the E part presents uh, results and generates partial dependence plots, creates feature independence, uh, feature importance, sorry, and this is again done using Python. So the final part, the F part, uh, outputs the model uh, in either pickle or PMML form and generates HTML report which summarizes whatever uh, happened during the tool journey for users which can be uh, finally shared with other stakeholders and uh, uh, used uh, again. Uh, so the next few uh, slides are basically the web portal screens of uh, our tool. So as uh, we mentioned before, this is a guided uh, uh, no, uh, no, no code uh, machine learning tool. So we try to describe everything what is going behind the clicks to the users. Uh, this is the first page of the tool. Uh, again, it's explaining what's happening behind uh, the box, uh, what we are doing, uh, how uh, how various uh, linearity is assessed, how uh, uh, down sampling is being done, how uh, in uh, data imbalance is being uh, addressed. Everything is explained in this. Uh, currently, we just uh, give two options uh, to the user, uh, one a linear model, which is basically a linear regression or a logistic regression, and a non-linear model, uh, which is random forest. But in future, we are trying to incorporate 
more and more models. Uh, this is the result section. This and the next slide, which explains the feature importances, uh, is basically to explain how the model is doing, uh, what is the val uh, validating the model, uh, which are the features which are uh, which the model thinks are the most useful to predict a particular target. As you can see in this case of a dummy data set. Uh, next slide. So a uh, partial dependency plot is another way to try to explain why the model is predicting what it is predicting by comparing only one of the variables at a time and seeing how the target variable changes uh, with the change in the value of one of the dependent variable. This is the final page of the tool uh, where, as I said, uh, it summarizes uh, the results uh, that happened during the tool and gives an option to download a HTML report and even uh, the results and the, finally the model, which, which can be further uh, deployed uh, using another uh, tool which we created using Nine. So uh, use of Python in AI predict. So Nine, as we saw, Nine provides Python integration nodes to uh, help us embed uh, Python codes within workflows, which uh, helps to create uh, machine learning functionalities which are advanced and not really right now in Nine, but still help us to. Uh, do what we are trying to achieve. Uh, in this tool, we are, uh, as I mentioned before, we are using Python code to create linear and nonlinear models and do post-process analysis of the results, like calculating and plotting feature importance, uh, creating PDP plots of user-selected input variables to help user understand uh, which are the variables that are most affecting the target variable and how the model is making the decisions while making the predictions. Uh, so this is again uh, the zoomed in version of uh, how the Python scripts are uh, located uh, within our workflow. Uh, currently, uh, as I mentioned, there's just linear and nonlinear model, uh, sorry, uh, random forest and linear regression model, but we will incorporate more. Another thing, uh, so currently we are explaining using partial dependency plot within uh, Python, but uh, we are also trying, uh, we will also try to explain, see if we can improve the explanation by adding Lime and Shapely nodes from Lime and see whether that helps us or not. I'll hand over to Adam now. Okay, thanks Akash. Um, yes. So to give a little bit of background on um, what, how we've kind of come to this place where we're uh, deploying our, our, our web apps and uh, kind of integrating Python within Nine, um, we had a, a quite a, a number of factors to consider on you know the, the the tools that we're using and how we wanted to deploy. Um, so to give a bit of background, our our team that we work with um, is a small team, but we're uh, quite a multidiscipline team with quite a diverse range of skills and experience. So um, for for some people, um, are come to our team from a more maybe engineering background, um, and then maybe some others that have a more maybe more traditional statistical or, or, or data science background. So you can imagine people come in with um, different experiences using different tools. So there's quite a lot of factors to, to kind of consider for um, what tools we want to use. And, you know, some of them we've got in the table there, the, these um, kind of factors will be different for different people. So it's all about how we, we try and um, get the most out of our team and, and get the most out of um, the tools that we're using. So what we found is that Nime really provides a common language that's really easy to interpret for our team. So um, with the kind of graphical uh, interface, um, you know, it, and being able to see each process individually, it's really easy for someone who's even quite new to Nime to come in and, and interpret what's going on in an application. Whereas if we'd chosen to just do everything in Python, um, you know, it's it's a lot less approachable. Um, and, and can be a lot less uh, kind of familiar for people. But because Nime can 
include things like Python, R, Java, in workflows, and um, we feel that we don't really compromise on the functionality. And and uh, you know, as Nime covers the full data science stack, including deployment, and you know, we've got a Nime server installation. We use the Nime uh, web portal. And um, then we feel that it's it's a, a really good kind of development and deployment environment where um, it's really approachable from for a lot of users in our team, but also we're still able to maximize the functionality we get by by bringing um, parts of Python into into our applications as well. And also the advantage of the web portal and um, with the non -data, data scientists coming in, they can configure an algorithm that's been coded in Python, but they're only using kind of drop down boxes. So really across of all of these factors um, we, we felt that um, kind of utilizing Nime was the, the best tool for us and so that's why we try and use um, Nime and the kind of the, the functionality within Nime um, as much as possible. But comparing Python to Nime um, really actually what we're doing is, is Python with Nime um, but still um, had a you know had to kind of develop how how we best integrate this so when we first started developing with nine and python um previously we'd have applications that were really kind of developed and managed on an individual basis so the the people in our team who are more experienced using python what they would tend to do would be write an application fully in python just python snippets and then wrap it in a nine workflow for it to be deployed on on the nine server whereas people who are more experienced in say java or or just nine and um, would more likely write an application just using the nine native nodes and um, and what that meant was that it was really inefficient because a lot of our work was repeated you know writing similar functionality but writing it two different ways and also if we had people that would move on from their role and someone else had to to pick up and manage their applications then it was really difficult um for someone who's picking up an application that might be in an unfamiliar language so what we kind of implemented as a solution for our team is that um when we're we're deploying in in Nime and, and integrating Python into it, with Nime we use Nime nodes for as much as possible. Any simple processes, um, say reading in data um, and things like that, any data data manipulation, we do as much as possible uh, with that in in Nime. With Python, we use it at specific points in a workflow where we feel we're going to get a benefit. For example, whether that's maybe more functionality and um, a little bit more input into the configuration of an algorithm, maybe more control on the algorithm, or maybe just the developer feels a bit more confident in um, building the algorithm in Python itself. And, and we find that the right balance gives us the best result. So to, to give a bit of an example, one of our previous applications, we actually ended up rewriting a lot of it because there were significant sections throughout the workflow where um, there would be individual Python scripts that were running just for each uh, individual function. So it might have been reading in a data set. And we found that was really kind of um, really inefficient and, and didn't run particularly well either. Um, obviously, the, the Python integration in Nime is is... Uh, kind of a lot more seamless now but we found that on our servers and um, we were struggling a little bit and now finding that right balance we've got a lot more um a lot more of a, a robust approach and and development so for our kind of future developments and improvements uh, some of the things that we're considering and um, as monty mentioned about uh, the condo environment propagation node that's something that we're considering um, so previously what we did with uh, was when we configured Nime to just use the base um, Anaconda environment on our, our on our Nime server, then we would have one single environment which we put all the packages in for all of our applications, which is really bad practice. Um, but what we're trying to do now is to set up specific um, environments for each of our applications. And that means if there's things like um, any libraries are updated um, or you know, if, if a library updates, then it might um, cause another tool to fall over somewhere else. So it means that we've got a lot more tighter management on, on our infrastructure as well. We've tested that on some workflows and, and we're looking to implement that onto our, our AA tools that I've mentioned. And um, also model deployment as well. So once we built our model in, in AA Predict, I should say, AA predict there, sorry, um, it could be utilized further. So initially someone might come and, and build a model and try and get some insight into the, the data set they've uploaded into the tool. But with the, the framework within Nime, um, it'll, 
allows us to kind of once someone's built that model then export it and use it on run it on other data sets or, or more more recent data that's come through to, to test the model and, and and then use it for other applications as well and um, so what we've done is we've tested the the framework on uh, some other applications as well but only with models that are built using the the native nine nodes and we're still in in a process of of uh, integrating um, the, the models that have been built in Python into that framework as well. And then of course um, we're looking to build more tools as well, additional functionality. So obviously the functionality we've got in the, the, the um, application that we mentioned is a little bit limited in the sense it's uh, you know it's just uh, a couple of linear methods and, and random forest for non-linear um, and obviously that's not going to fit every single um, data set or every single problem what we're just trying to do with that initial set is to replicate some initial steps that a data scientist might take and then we can go, come in and, and and speak to the user and try and give them pointers of, of where they might want to go but as a kind of initial first pass on the data it, it's quite good but of course we'd like to to cover more bases so we are looking to develop more tools as well and that would suit other uh, data problems and, and other data sets as well so just to conclude um We've uh, we've built a, our our data infrastructure here at Tata Steel. Um, we've we've built that and developed that in Nine, but Python's also quite an important part of that as well. And what we found is that integrating the two, we really do kind of get the best of both um, both those tools. And but we're still looking to develop those tools further and kind of increase the functionality as well, and also make them more robust. So. Thanks very much for, for having us at this session and, and for listening. We're happy to, to take any questions now as well. Uh, thank you. Thank you for the great presentation. The chat was on fire on so many other different topics besides yours that it's, uh, let's time a bit, um, give a bit more time for people to take questions. But I have, a, I have a question. So I've seen the big workflow you guys have on that slides, right? You have all the letters, A, B, C, D. Like, that is a huge workflow. Like, can you say, like, how long it took you guys to, to build such a big workflow? Was it like a one-month project, six-month project, or is it just keep on going since uh, uh, one year or something? Uh, can you comment on that? Um, I think the initial development of the kind of first pass of the the, the application that we built, um, it was probably across uh, probably a month or so to get um, a kind of first thing working. But um, we've kind of revisited that workflow quite a few times and added extra functionality. And also it's quite important as well that we found is to get user feedback. And um, so getting people in the business to use the application and there's things that you would never think of that they'll come up with that um, you can make to, to make their experience a lot better or functionality that's missing. So, I mean, I think that workflow has probably been under develop a cache for a, a good year or so, maybe even more. Um, but it, it's kind of gradual and continual. Improvement. Right. So basically you're saying that to actually implement the web app and deploy it and tell people, hey, here's the link, use it, it took like a month. But then all the process that you would need in general when you have such a uh, big uh, uh, application to collect feedback and actually to go through some user testing, right, that is uh, is a bit slower, but it's, it's something that's true yeah. for any web application, right? Like... So you could say that maybe the, the time that it took to, to implement it was pretty fast, but then the, the complexity is still there, right? Like, uh... Yeah, absolutely. And yeah, we kind of released some more kind of development version and, and tested it ourselves within the group and then um, kind of opened up to a few more people. But yeah, still, I, I would say that the first couple of months as well of, of users using it, we still needed to be quite hands-on um, before we got it to a place where we were happy for you know, it, it just to be fully released and, and people to use. Right. Um, and uh, I, I, while well, I'm still keeping an eye on the chat, um, I've seen, oh, here, uh, I think we have a question from, uh, uh, for Akash, but maybe it's related to the CICD topic you guys were. Yeah, it's something else. 
Yeah, because you can, <laughs> Akash is <laughs> having a whole debate, debate on CICD <laughs> approach next to the presentation. Um, but that's another topic, right? CICD, how to actually have a way to maintain and update, especially if there is machine learning involved, right? And Python code being version, it's a... Uh, it's one thing to to keep it up and running once, and another that where you have a um, a way to continuously integrate and and, and deploy um, all of that. Um, I, I have another question. So basically, right now uh, you were using a single con environment for both Nime server and for your uh, Nime analytics platform, right? So the a single base uh, con environment. Did I get that correctly? Um, so yes, yeah, so we were using a single base environment for for the server, which the web portal was was running on as well. Um, so, but then for our, our local analytics platform, we would have separate um, env environments for that. But yeah, it was a kind of a single environment for um, everything that was deployed on the server, um, including the web apps as well. And and I guess that was also tricky when a new package had to be added. Then you also had to add it to the server and to also a cache laptop. And and there was some conversation there that was really manual, I guess, right? Yeah, absolutely. A lot of yeah. kind of manual intervention, and and yeah. particularly as well, we're we're limited in a way that um uh, our our servers are limited with what network um kind of connection that they're able to have. And um, so sometimes it's been a case where we've had to um. Uh, kind of, uh, you know, install packages locally and then move them manually across the server, which is um, obviously quite time-consuming and, and a manual process, as you say. Right, right, right. Yeah, um, I guess that um, lots of things are coming, as you can see from the name side. Like, for example, uh, you said at some point that you have uh, some users, they're only doing uh, Python and some users, they're only doing name and then there was some redundancy, right? Because they were not looking at each other's work. So but from Anderson, from that slide, I understood that you guys are looking at what features Nime already have. And only when there is that one package in Python that Nime doesn't have as a node, you're going to, to then adopt it. Uh, did I understand correctly? So basically import it and uh, uh, from there, because in the end, I, I mean, Nime has over 4,000 nodes, I think now, mm. but the number of packages offered by the Python open source community is a, is a total different magnitude, I think. So I guess it's okay if there is some, I don't know, maybe in the uh, steel manufacturer domain, some domain uh, specific Python package that you guys need to adopt, or even if it's some statistical uh, package, right? Some, something for analytics and statistics. Yeah. So yeah, that that's generally the the approach we'd look to take is that if it's available in Nime, um, then then we'll use the Nime nodes uh, for it. That sometimes I guess um, it depends on on the developer and um, if they're a lot more familiar with Python than for a specific algorithm or or if they feel a little bit more comfortable writing a little section of the workflow in Python. Um, that they feel like they're going to get some benefit from, then then that's fine. That's what they would do. But um, I think the the real thing that we're looking to do is the the majority of the data processing, especially um, when there's the functionality in Nime, uh, obviously to do that, um, and then to really limit and focus down the 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 sections of the workflows that have Python in, because you you see that workflow was was reasonably big. That you know if if and there was a lot of components in it for the web portal interaction that. If you could end up having maybe 10 separate points in the workflow where you have Python nodes with perhaps different packages and things. So right. if, if it's easy and traceable, then, um, and, and we only have a couple of sections that we know that there's Python in, um, then that's what we, we kind of try try to do. Okay, so there is a question actually from the audience right now. Anyway, yeah, I, that's really on on, on perfect. That this kind of because I mean you need to keep it agile, but also uh, being able to to not make uh, everything break whenever there is update. Also, Nime is backwards compatible, meaning you use a Nime node today, we update Nime 
that no, this uh, is not going to break with the update, right? We make sure that it's always going to execute given that deployment that you did, right? So sometimes when you use some Python packages and you update them, like it's it's not as uh, as uh, I mean, it's the the open source Python, so Python's open source community. So there is a question from the chat. Stefan is asking, did I get that right that you're using Python for XAI? Or did I miss her that? Out of curiosity, which packages are you using to explain the models basically in uh, in Python through Nime? That's uh, that, Akash. yeah. Uh, uh, what do you mean? Uh, like I don't know what's XAI. I personally, I think he's referring to the partial dependence part that you are using like a line plot instead of. Uh, no, no, like uh, what we we are thinking to incorporate that in future. Right now, we are using uh, uh, Scikit-learn and uh, Matplotlib for okay. Explanation. Okay, so the built-in Scikit-learn and Matplotlib, yeah, yeah. We 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 released a machine learning extension back then, but you need to look at those examples on how to simple the data right for the partial dependence and. I guess it, it it really depends where the model is trained. If the model is trained in Saki Learn, maybe this is approach also works. But if the model is trained with Nime, definitely using the Nime partial dependence node and components is, comes in way more handy. Yeah, yeah. XAI Syed Ali is uh, explaining to everyone stands for explainable AI. I mean, there are all those topics, right? Before when I was studying this in university, it was MLI. Machine learning compatibility now is interpretable machine learning XAI. So many different uh, acronyms are changing over time. All right, so we'll take one more questions if anyone have it, and and unless the, then maybe we can move to the networking. Monty, uh, I do you have any question? I I can put you on on speaker mode for if you if you have any questions. Yeah, and gun, where are you? Uh, here it is, Monty. There you are. Can you hear me? Can you, yeah, now everyone can hear you. Okay, uh, I have a question for Akash and Adam. Uh, I mean, fantastic use case of Python 9, also explainable AI. Uh, but I wanted to ask you, how often do you train this model? Is it like every month, every week, or is it like trained and you just use it for predicting every day? So uh, it's like uh, whenever a user opens a new project, he uploads the data set and as you go through the tool, a new model would be created and it would be stored. So then there's another tool that we have created so that if a user thinks that the model is pretty good by after validating the model, uh, he or she can then use that tool, which again we have created using NIME, uh, the uh, CI CD integration nodes, which NIME has provided uh, to deploy it in the production yeah so every time uh, the tool is uh, run a new model is created basically okay nice and then uh, about using the explainable ai technique which you used the partial dependence plot was it like the users asked for it or you wanted to provide it apart from the model that this is how the model is using the information so what we do is we provide user with the feature importances in the first page and then we ask them which uh, do they want to see a partial dependency plot of the most uh, high important, uh, important variables. So if the variables that the user selects, those are the partial dependency plots which are showed. Okay, nice. Thank you so much. I mean, yes. yeah, that adds a lot of value. Cheers. Cheers. All right. Thank you, Monty. Uh, I think that uh, at this point we can, I mean, that's the cool thing about this map, right? You can find Adam, approach him, engage in a 1v1 conversation, someone else find Akash, another 1v1 conversation, Monty, same thing. And, and it would be nice now to move now to the bottom part of this virtual map on the beach where you can also maybe find other educators, like people that teach NIME or just explore the map. And uh, Steve, Richard, and I will be speaking about the next event. Thank you again, Akash, Adam, and Monty for your presentation. And and yeah, see you, see you on the beach. Cheers. Thanks a lot.